A simple CMOS process consists of an NMOS process and a PMOS process. The N standing for negative and P for positive. MOS, metal oxide semiconductor. CMOS, complementary metal oxide semiconductor. And the complementary in this case is being able to form an N well and a P well. Overall, in this process, there are going to be 16 lithographic masks masks used and I will briefly outline the flow. The initial step is to obviously choose the substrate. The second to form the active region. The third to form the N and P well. The fourth adjust the threshold voltage, increase the threshold voltage, 5, form the gate, 6, form what are known as tips or extensions, 7, form the source or drain, and then you have processes which are to join it to the rest of the circuit on the printer circuit board. So that includes interconnects and multi-level metal formation. In general, silicon is of the obvious choice due to its relative abundance, its manufacturability, the fact that when it's oxidized, the quality of the, the semiconductor oxide layer is the highest known to man. Its electronic properties obviously having a moderate band gap and being able to be doped easily with high precision. Its chemical stability, its temperature behavior etc. So silicon is manufactured on the 100 plane. This is the plane of choice in the industry and it is normally doped with P type semiconductor such as first then to form the active region. Thermal oxidation of the silicon is occurred either wet or dry. This is to produce that thin silicon oxide layer. Notice however that before this actually happens, during the manufacturing of silicon, there will naturally be a silicon oxide layer. But this is this is removed due to the fact that it won't be homogeneous, it won't be uniform, and the thickness won't be correct. So so it is removed and controlled thermal oxidation is done either wet or dry. Then silicon nitride SI3 and 4 is deposited using LPCVD and a photoresist is spin coated on the substrate, on the silicon nitride layer. Why did we add silicon oxide? To alleviate the stress on the substrate due to the lattice mismatch of the silicon nitride and the silicon substrate. 
Next, we expose the system to UV radiation, ultraviolet, and we use this to unmask one. So, here is a typical mask. In total, there are going to be 16 masks. However, there could be varying numbers of masks depending on what strategy is employed. And we won't actually talk about all 16 in this video. After UV light is shown on it, the photoresist will react in regions where it was designed to become soft due to UV radiation and that's washed away. Then, etching of silicon nitride is performed using some kind of plasma, flowing based plasma. Step 3 is removing the photoresist using sulfuric acid. This can also be a Q2 plasma and it is the generic cleaning step that will happen multiple times. Step 4 is to oxidize further the silicon dioxide layer. So notice the silicon nitride prevents further oxidation of silicon. This is due to the density of silicon nitride. It's very dense and it prevents silicon dioxide from growing. Then the silicon nitride is stripped using hot phosphoric acid, H3PO4. Notice also that the silicon nitride actually overlaps with some of the oxide, the field oxide layer. This is undesirable and simply due to diffusion process. Now the flow arrives at the NMP well formation. A photoresist is deposited using mass 2 and iron implantation of a P-type dopant is induced onto the silicon substrate. It passes through the thin oxide layer and is embedded near the surface of the silicon substrate. The same is done for the anti-dopant. Notice that the P well and the N well are exactly the same depth. It is important to be able to control this depth and the rate at which the well grows. This is seen in the next step where annealing occurs to grow the wells. Further, annealing actually heals some of the damage caused by an implantation. Next, to increase the threshold voltage, an extra layer of P-type and N-type dopant is added. This improves the performance of the overall piece. Then, to form the gate oxide layer, that thin oxide layer, that silicon dioxide layer from before is stripped with hydrofluoric acid. Notice that hydrofluoric acid is a agent of glass and of course this is glass. So the gate oxide is formed by dry or wet oxidation. LPCBT is then used to deposit the polysilicon layer. 
this would be where the active component lies then an implementation of an n type document is performed on the polysilicon layer to make it active electronically then the polysilicon is etched by plasma to retain the necessary pattern of polysilicon on the on the piece to form the extension or the tip iron implantation of phosphorus occurs iron implantation of an n-type dopant and a p-type dopant is performed to form as you can see the tips on the wells and by LPCBD silicon dioxide or silicon nitride is then placed on top of the whole layer and this is etched anisotropically with flowing based plasma so that only the sides of the dielectric remain to grow the thin screen oxide that is now called iron implantation of arsenic which is a better n-type dopant than phosphorus is acted so if arsenic is a better n-type dopant why haven't we been using arsenic all the time and why have we been using phosphorus simply arsenic is not that reliable when it's in silica it's again lattice mismatch and several issues arise when trying to dope silicon directly so here we are doping what is already doped and therefore there is a, a smaller desire for precision the same is done on the other side with a p-type dopant finally to finish the CMOS process before moving on to metallization and all that. The system is annealed and this does three things it activates all implants so that they can perform as they should it annuls any damage 
increasing the performance again and it also increases the thickness of the N and P wells. Thank you.